Hey, a few weeks ago, I got to go on a retreat, a trip to Colorado, uh, and it was an amazing trip. So many incredible views and a lot of unforgettable moments. Uh, I got to go hiking through the wilderness pretty much by myself most of the time and just got to sit in God's Word. And while I was there at this retreat, I got to kind of process through, wrestle through uh, some of the hurt that I've experienced in my life. Uh, and I got to struggle through some of the, the brokenness that I still carry with me. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, I got to sit in God's word more in one day than I do in a whole week. And I walked away just feeling so refreshed and encouraged and ready for this next season of life. And, and you know what I thought this morning, why don't we do the same thing? Why don't we wrestle with some of our hurt and why don't we sit in God's word together? So if you have a Bible, you can open it up to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. As you uh, look that up, I want to give you a second. Uh, but let's talk about where we're at. We're in the middle of a series called Triggered. Uh, and we're talking about how we live in this world that is easily offended. I think we can all understand the, the, the idea there, right? We've probably offended people by something we did or said. And we, we really understand what it feels like to be offended uh, because of someone's actions or, or someone's hurtful words. And, and so this this morning, I want to ask you to go back there. Go back to a place where you felt the most offended by someone. Go back to a place where you you stepped into that trigger and you fell into some hurt. Go back to that place where you felt like there was that spirit of division coming between you and someone else. Just sit in that for a moment. While you have that fresh on your mind, let's read God's word together. Matthew 18, uh, verse 21 through 35. It's a quick read. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell to his knees before him. Be patient with me. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But then he refused. Instead, he went off and had the servant thrown into prison until he could pay the debt back. When the other servant saw what had happened... They were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Our sermon in a sentence uh, this morning goes like this. When we live in a world that is easily offended, it leads us to a place where hurt is common, but forgiveness isn't. Let me say that one more time for you. When we live in a world that is easily offended, we lead to a place where hurt is common, but forgiveness isn't. If I were to be completely honest with you this morning, I'd have to tell you that I struggle with forgiveness. I don't know if you're anything like me, but I struggle with, with this idea, this concept of grace. I struggle with this idea of, of just openly forgiving people and letting go of grudges. I struggle with that a lot. Now, oftentimes you'll hear a pastor say, hey, when I preach a sermon, the first person that I'm preaching to is myself and then my family and then the congregation. And i got to be honest with you, that's me this morning. Like this message that I've written, it's first and foremost for me, uh, and then it's for my family, and then it's for you. 
But let me tell you why I struggle with forgiveness. My biological mom was a drug addict and a drunk. Uh, She often sold herself uh, for money so she could buy more drugs. Because of her lifestyle, uh, I have five half-brothers and a half-sister. Because of her lifestyle, uh, she got arrested so many times that the courts deemed her unfit to be a mother. And so all of our siblings, we got split up and moved into a different family uh, members' homes. And so at the age of two, I was going to go live with my granny, and that's her right there. Uh, and my granny was, she was a saint. Uh, she loved me so much, and she, she actually ended up going back to work so that she could provide for us. She worked at the bar that was right behind our apartment complex, and, and I remember every single day I'd get out of daycare, and I would come, and I would just, I would sit at a table and wait for her to get off. And she would always order me ribs, like I got to be honest with you, I hate ribs from stores now. Like restaurants that sell ribs, like I just can't do it, can't even stand lo- to look at them. But I remember sitting there for hours waiting for her to get off. One day, my granny came and told me that she felt she wasn't going to be able to give me the life that I deserved. She told me she loved me, but because she was constantly having to bail my mother out of jail, that I was going to be put up for adoption. I was four at the time. And the next three years of my life were crazy. I got bounced from home to home, and I got moved from foster care system to foster care system. And in those three years of my life, uh, I would see domestic violence. I would see abuse. See a loved one be assaulted. And I got to be honest with you. There was only one person to blame for all of this, and it was my crackpot mother. I hated her, and I hated her so much. And so when we read these words of of Peter and Jesus' conversation, i got to be honest with you, they don't sit well with me. This is what it says in Matthew 18, 21 through 22. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. When we get offended, if we're being real this morning, the last thing that we think about is forgiveness. Like someone offends us and and someone's triggered us. Like we're not looking to like, you know, extend an olive branch and, and fix things in the moment. No, Adam mentioned two weeks ago, our first response typically is anger. We lash out in anger. We want to get even, we want to get right, we want to make things fair, and that's our first response. And so when Jesus says, hey, it's not seven times, like, let's up the number a little bit, he puts it to this unrealistic number, and I think that he, he knows something. He knows that hurt's going to happen. He knows that in our life, Hurt is going to happen. And I think that he knows that our humanity has a tendency uh, to, to break out, to, to offend people. He knows that our humanity has a tendency to hurt people, even the people that are closest to us and the people that we love so dearly. Hurt happens. Can I offer you some advice this morning? In those moments where you've been offended and the last thing on your mind is forgiveness, can you just say those words, hurt happen? It's a part of the life that we live. It's a part of the world that we live in. And hurt happens because in Genesis chapter 3, we we sinned and we fell and we're still falling. Like hurt happens and offenses happen. Can I encourage you to say those words? Hurt happens. Now, I don't want you to say it in a way that minimalizes the hurt that you're experiencing. But say it in a way that minimalizes your response to the offense. Say hurt happens and figure out the Christ way to respond. See, Jesus, he knows our condition, right? He knows the things that we struggle with. He knows our sin and shame are a part of the picture. He knows that hurt will happen and hurt will come. But what he tells us is that forgiveness should come to you. As I got older, I started to understand that hurt happens. I'd experienced it in my life, and, 
And I remember I was 17 years old at a week of camp at Lake Aurora Christian Camp in Lake Wales, Florida. I remember a specific morning I was opening up my devotion book, and in it, uh, it was like our quiet time for the day. There was this verse, and it was Matthew 7, 47. It says, but whoever forgives little loves little. Let me say that again. The verse ends, but whoever forgives little loves little. In that moment, God did something. I can't explain to you what it was, but I understood in that moment that I was a person who had a lot of unforgiveness in my life. That I had a lot of unforgiveness that just weighed on who I was. And I decided I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have that. So I made a crazy decision. I closed my booklet, I ran back to my cabin, and I got my phone out of my pillowcase where I hadn't been hiding it from my counselor all week. Yes, I was that, that student. I did some research and I found out the phone number to my biological mom. I dialed it, called her, and she answered. And for moments just stretched out. It was dead silent. We didn't say one word. And then I just started to cry. Like grown man, weeping, crying. I didn't know what to say. And then on the other end of the phone, I heard her start to weep. And I got to this place where I was able to say, Lori, I forgive you. And then through her tears, she said, oh, Joey, I am so sorry. And we began to weep and cry even more, and, and I felt like I had to tell her what God was doing in my heart. So I told her that, that I was reading this verse, and, and for all of my life, I had hated her. I had been offended by the things that she had done to me. And because of, of what she did, I lived with these triggers. that Anytime I felt like someone was about to leave my life, I would freak out because I had some abandonment issues. And I told her that, that in that moment, I believed that God had put it on my heart, that he had convicted me to forgive her of those pains, those hurts, those offenses that I had experienced because of her. This parable, it's an interesting one. It tells of a king who, who forgave a great debt of a servant. But that servant wouldn't forgive the small debt that he had of a fellow servant. And, and then the idea of this parable that, that Peter is trying to figure out and that we're figuring out now is that, is that forgiven people should forgive people. That's the whole point of the story. That's what Jesus is telling Peter right there in that moment. That's what he's telling us here right now is that as for forgiven people of God, we are called to forgive other people. Look, Paul, he writes in Ephesians 4.32, John mentioned this earlier, the Bible tells us, it says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgive each other just as Christ God forgave you. And then he echoes himself again in Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I did a little bit of research into the topic of forgiveness, and I found a survey uh, that was out there online, and it, it mentioned that 75% of the people surveyed believed that Jesus Christ had forgiven them of their sins, which is amazing. But also on that survey was a staggering statistic. 52% of the people surveyed believed that they had forgiven someone. 52%. That's a failing grade. And it it illustrates a point to me that that we have a problem. We have a problem with holding on to to the the offenses that we've been sitting in. We have a problem with holding grudges. We, We as a people, we have a problem with unforgiveness. Hurt happens. But at some point, we have to take a step. We have to make some type of movement towards forgiveness 
If we were to look back at how the parable starts to end in verse 22 and 23, it goes like this. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Getting hurt, being offended, it happens. But we cannot allow unforgiveness to fester in our hearts. We cannot allow unresolved emotions and situations to weigh on our chest and to weigh heavy on our minds. Because here's what happens. Number one, it impacts the way that you treat that singular person. Number two, it impacts the way that you you have relationships with everybody else. And then number three, and ultimately, it holds us back from an eternity with God. Like that's what unforgiveness does. Verse 34, this is how the parable ends. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. I don't know if you've ever heard of a parable before, but the way that we, we kind of talk about it is an, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meeting. I think it's like real Christianese that we say that a lot, but um, it's true. Like this is just an example of our, relation, our relationship with God. And so if we were to read this back, it, in anger, God handed us over to hell, Satan, you can fill in the blank there, to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Unforgiveness it holds us back from an eternity with God in heaven. So if I could encourage you anything right now in this moment, it'd just be to remember that, a, that God forgave you. And so you're called to forgive other people. That is what we are called to do. Now, how you want to do that, that's up to you. Um, that's kind of the hard part, right? And I don't think that scripture tells us exactly in one verse what we are supposed to do when we have to forgive people. I'll be honest, if it was, it would make things so much easier. Like we would just have these set steps that we could just say, hey, like I did this, did this, this, and and now we're forgiven. Everything's good. There's not one set way. And it makes it hard. It makes it messy. It makes it so difficult to be in those conversations with those people who have hurt us. For a long time, I struggled to understand what forgiveness looked like in me and my biological mom's relationship. Like now that we had that conversation, does it mean that she gets to come to Christmas every year? Like now that we have that conversation, does it mean that, that, that her and I, like we call each other every week and we just catch up and, and we just see how each other are doing? Now that we've had that conversation, does it look like her and I, we get into this big group hug like the Tanner family off of Fuller House? Like, is that what it's supposed to look like? I don't know. I think it looks different in each and every single one of our contexts. Scripture doesn't have one set way, but it has stories of grace. And it has stories of broken families that are just reunited. I think about the story of Joseph. Joseph in the, in the coat of many colors, the Old Testament story, right? Like there's this story where Joseph, he is thrown into a pit and then he's sold into slavery by none other than his family. And then he goes the rest of his life traveling in, in slavery and then he gets arrested, put in prison. And then somehow by the grace of God, he ends up in a place where he's second in command of all of Egypt. And then this crazy thing happens where his brothers, the ones who betrayed him, they come into the picture, and Joseph knows. Joseph knows who they are, and he knows what they did, and he makes this wild decision to forgive them. And he allows them and his whole family to come into the kingdom where they'll be kept safe, where they'll be be fed. It's a crazy story of restoration. But then I think of stories like, like Paul, Paul, the, the, the apostle, right, the guy who wrote all of the New Testament. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Paul had beef with a guy, and his name was John Mark. John Mark and him had this, this like, butting of heads, and, and it all happened because John Mark, on his very first missionary journey with Paul, abandoned him, like, left him all by himself, and Paul was hurt. He was offended, 
And he decided, you know what, I never want John Mark to be a part of the picture again. In fact, he gets into like an argument with some other apostles and he says, look, like you can take John Mark and you can go the other way. I'll take this other person and and we'll go the opposite. They butt heads. But in the last chapter of Paul's life in 2 Timothy, Paul writes this letter to Timothy and says, you know what, John Mark was good for me all along. Like, he's good for my ministry. Can you bring him to me? Can we do this last missionary act together? And it's this beautiful story of reconciliation. And then I think about God, right? God who so loved the earth that he gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not die but have eternal life. A God who stepped out of eternity for me and for you. Perfect example of what forgiveness looks like. Now you might be thinking, Joey, what are you, what are you saying here? Like, what do those stories have to do with me and this, this person that I'm struggling to forgive? What does it have to do with this? Like, are you saying that I have to get back in a relationship with them? Are you saying that, like, I have to befriend them or, like, be kind to them? Like, what, what are you asking of me? Why can't I just forgive them, move on, like, forget about it and, and just get out of Dodge? There's this phrase that a lot of people say, uh, and you might have heard, like, someone in your family say it before. But it goes like this. It says, uh, some people are best loved from afar. Like, I feel like I've heard my granny say that. Like, some people are just, just best loved from afar. You know, we say that. We say that about that, that one annoying relative, that every time they show up to the family function, it's filled with drama. Like, and we're just like, you know, some people, they're just best loved from afar. And then, and then when that one coworker walks into the room, you just instantly get tensed, and you're triggered by just their existence. You know who I'm talking about. And you just say that phrase, some people... They're just best left from afar. Can I tell you what I think about that phrase? You didn't ask me for my opinion this morning, but I'm going to give it, okay? I think that that phrase is straight from the mouth of Satan. Like, can I be real with you? I think that, that there's nothing more than what, what Satan wants to do is just slip that little comment into your ear and say, hey, you know, some people, they're just best left from afar. You don't have to have a relationship with them. Oh, they hurt you? Oh, definitely love them from afar. You didn't ask for my opinion, but I'm so thankful that my dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ didn't step out of eternity and say, hey, Joey, you're just best loved from afar. I'm sure you sit here this morning and you're thankful that God didn't say that about you. Jesus Christ, who stepped out of eternity, he shows us that forgiveness should lead to restoration and reconciliation. And since I would assume that Jesus Christ is the example of everything else that we follow, then he should be the example we follow in forgiveness too. I don't believe that forgiveness is a straight line. I don't believe it's a quick fix, and I don't think it's a quick repair to our relationship. It takes time. It takes effort. And it's going to zigzag all over the place. At the age of 19, I met my biological mom for the first time. I met her at a, at a funeral where we buried my granny together. I got a hug from her, and I'll be real with you, it was the oddest experience of my life. I didn't know if I should like it, hate it, enjoy it. Like, should I feel these warm feelings? Like, I didn't know. And so I I walked away from that experience thinking, you know what, things are going to be good. We can repair this. Like, we can can figure this out. Two months later, I get a call from uh, one of the people she knows, and she just tells me, hey, Uh, Your mom, she relapsed, uh, and she's in jail again. And so I gave it some time, and then Tabitha, being my amazing wife, encouraged me, Joey, you should try this again. And so at the age of 21, I went and drove to her hometown, talked to her, and I got baby photos that I'd never seen in my life. I got to know some things about me that I didn't know, And I walked away from that experience thinking, you know what? This could work. 
we can figure this out. Like we can, we can, we can pave a road in this relationship. And then two months later, I get a phone call. Hey, Joey, I just want to let you know that your mom's in jail again. She relapsed. Forgiveness is not a straight line. It's not a quick fix. It's not a quick repair. And oftentimes in that process of forgiveness, we're going to be re-triggered over and over and over again. But can we look at the example of Jesus Christ? He stepped down out of glory, knowing that we were the people that killed him. Knowing the, that we were the people that spat on him, that whipped him, that hung him on that cross. He knew that we were those people. He knew it. But he says, you know what, I want to be a part of your story. I want to bring restoration. I want to bring reconciliation. But both of those things, in our context, in our different situations, they can look so different. But this morning, I want to remind you, as we live in a world that is easily offended and hurt is common, so should forgiveness. So should forgiveness. And it's all because of what Jesus did for us. Let me pray for you. God, I love you and I thank you so much that you stepped out of eternity for me. You stepped out of a perfect place for each and every single one of us. Father, I pray right now that if we have any hint of unforgiveness in our heart, that God, you would just, you would convict us right now in this moment to make a step to start some movement to forgive those people who have offended us. To forgive those people who when they walk into the room, they're just, they're a trigger for us. God, no matter what hurt we've bared, God, I just pray that you would help us and move us towards forgiveness. Because Father, we know that you are the perfect example of what that looks like. So God, heal us so that we can heal our relationships. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it doesn't take long for us to look around the world and kind of see that brokenness, to see some of the, the unforgiveness, to see just real brokenness in our world. I think about Israel, what they're going through, the, the conflict that, that's there. There just needs to be peace. There needs to be an understanding that offenses happen and that, that we can heal from things. And ultimately, that we can have forgiveness. This morning, I want to encourage you during this song, man, lift up a prayer for those people trapped in this conflict. Pray for healing. Pray for restoration and reconciliation. But maybe this morning you're someone and you know, like, you've got beef with someone. Like, you know that, that you, you are triggered by this person. Can I, can I encourage you to just go ahead and pray for them? The altars are open. You can come and pray for them and just ask God into that relationship. I want to encourage you to do that. But I'd be naive to say that everybody in this room understands Jesus' forgiveness. If you don't know what that looks like, if you've never experienced that, there's people on the side of the room, just follow the light. Have a conversation about what, what that next step is for you. But let's stand and let's worship a Jesus who loves us so much.